Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is George Orling from HDSA, and I want to welcome you to uh, the latest installment of the HDSA Research Webinar Series. After a, a couple month hiatus for the summer break, hopefully everyone had a great summer. And uh, we're kicking off this the fall series here with uh, Marie Sauterer, who is the president and CEO of Vasinex. Uh, but before I introduce Maurice and his presentation, for those who Oops, apologize for that. For those who may be new to the webinar series or go to webinar, um, just wanted to let everyone know that you can, you, you're all on mute, but you can ask questions of Maurice uh, at any time during this presentation. Just go into the um, menu bar on the right hand side where it says questions and type your question um, right here and click send. And at the end of Maurice's presentation, we'll ask them on your behalf. In addition, we are uh, recording this and archiving this on our website as well as on our YouTube channel. So within a week or so, uh, we will have a recording of this so you can view it uh, at your leisure or you can forward on the link to maybe someone in your family that might find this of interest to them uh, that can't participate live this afternoon. So you can find that on our website, hcsa.org backslash research webinars, or uh, eventually, uh, it's a little small here, but click on the YouTube icon on our website, and it'll take you to our YouTube channel where we have all of the different research webinars, including this one from today, will we'll all reside. So with, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Maurice Sauterer. Um, he's the founder and president uh, and chief executive officer of Vasinix Incorporated. Uh, prior to founding the uh, Vasinex in 1997, Dr. Zorer was an associate professor at the University of Rochester. Um, and prior to that, he was a senior fac he held senior faculty positions at Columbia University. Uh, during his academic career, Dr. Zorer held the position of visiting scientist at the Laboratory of uh, Cell Biology uh, at the Ontario Cancer Institute and the National Cancer Institute. Um, Dr. Zoder received his bachelor's degree in physics from Yeshiva University and a PhD in cell biology from the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, today, uh, Dr. Zoder is going to be presenting an update on the SIGNAL trial, which is testing an antibody uh, that is uh, against or, or antagonizes a uh, protein called semaphorin 4D in HD patients. I'm going to turn it over to you, Maurice. And show your slides and the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, George. And uh, thank you everyone for taking the time to uh, call in for this discussion. I'm looking forward to sharing with you some of the data that we've uh, generated in the SIGNAL study. The SIGNAL study is a phase two clinical trial, which as George just indicate, indicated uh, tests an antibody that uh, Vaxinex, our company, has developed that's specific for semaphorin 4D. So antibodies are large molecules, so-called biologics, and this is the first antibody to be tested in Huntington's disease. And what it does is, uh, because antibodies are very specific, they are useful, among other things, for blocking molecules that are thought to play a role in the disease process. We think that semaphorin 4D, the target of our antibody, which we call VX15, is relevant to Huntington's disease because we've demonstrated in a number of studies that it activates, semaphorin 4D activates inflammatory cells in the brain. And it's been shown in a number of neurodegenerative diseases, including Huntington's disease, that inflammatory processes are important in the degeneration that occurs during the disease. And so we tested this in preclinical studies and got very encouraging data, and on that basis have initiated a, a phase two clinical study in Huntington's disease. The design of that study is shown on this first slide. So this has what's known as an adaptive design. There are two cohorts, cohort A and cohort B, and the results of cohort A will be used to inform the design of cohort B. Uh, cohort A, we enrolled 36 subjects, and the subjects in this study include both late prodromal or pre-manifest Huntington's disease people and uh, early manifest 
uh, patients who have been diagnosed with the early stages of Huntington's disease. Uh, they were enrolled in about equal numbers. And the first 36 subjects were randomized one-to-one -one drug to placebo and were treated once a month for six months with the antibody. At the end of those six months, uh, the patients on placebo crossed over to be treated with VX15 with the drug. So everyone was being treated with the drug for about another six months. Uh, and then we had a three-month safety follow-up period and were able to then analyze the data. Now, the data included a number of different things. Uh, we used imaging as a way to determine what the impact of the treatment was on the natural course of the disease in terms of the effects it has on the brain. Uh, in addition, we had a number of uh, clinical uh, studies uh, included. Uh, for example, we looked at impact on motor activity and on cognition. I'm going to be focusing today primarily on the imaging results. Uh, and the reason for that is those were the clearest data for the time frame in which we performed this study. But I'll comment at the end on some of the other results that we obtained. And so the imaging was done at baseline at the time that subjects enrolled in the study, and then every six months, so at six months and at 12 months. And we did two kinds of imaging. Uh, the first is MRI. MRI is a method that allows us to detect atrophy, degeneration of brain tissue in different parts of the brain. Uh, and the second uh, imaging modality is called FDG-PET. This is a method that allows us to detect the level of metabolic activity in the brain. The brain is very active and uses a lot of energy. Uh, FDG is an analog of glucose, which is the source of most of the energy used in the brain. And so we're able to use that to detect the level of uh, metabolism going on in the brain. And what I'm going to show you is that whereas in the natural course of the disease, there's both progressive atrophy and a progressive decline in metabolic activity, in the patients treated with our drug, we were able to limit that in, in the ways that you will see. And so first I'd like to just point out to you that one of the advantages of these imaging methods is that when you do this, you can see many different parts of the brain. And listed here are the different parts of the brain that we looked at in following this study. Uh, as some of you may know, there are some regions of the brain that have long been known to be affected in Huntington's disease, in particular the caudate and putamen in the so-called striatal region of the brain. But we had a particular interest in following up on some other academic studies that had been performed and had shown much more widespread effects of the disease in other regions of the brain, in particular in the cortex. And so we have many cortical regions included here that we focused on as well. And we'll be looking at the results in these regions uh, using the tools that we had available. And so this slide now is our first data slide. What I'm going to do is I'm first going to describe the MRI results, the impact on atrophy in the brain, and then I'm going to talk about the metabolic activity. And then at the end, I'll talk about the future directions of the study uh, and what we're going to continue doing to follow up on this data. So in this slide, uh, this looks at the effect of the treatment with VX15 during the first six months. So we had two groups. We had one group that received VX15 and another group that received placebo. Uh, they're symbolized here by the blue and the red bars on the right-hand side. And we made measurements of the MRI detected volume of different regions of the brain. Each of the different regions of the brain is represented by a dot in the left-hand panel and on the right-hand panel. Uh, the bars are the confidence interval, so a statistical measure of the variation in, in, in what we uh, were able to see in different subjects in the study. Uh, the difference between the two panels is on the left side, we're actually plotting the absolute change in MRI volume. And you can see that what we're looking at is the difference, the mean change, the average change in the group treated with VX15 during six months, minus the average change in the group treated with placebo during those same six months. And the difference between the two is a positive number. That vertical line in the middle is the zero axis. And you can see that most of these points are shifted to the right. 
And the reason it's a positive number is that there was greater MRI volume in each of those regions in the subjects who were treated with BX15 than in those who received placebo. This is really comes out, shows very clearly in the right-hand panel. The right-hand panel is actually the same data, but here, instead of plotting the absolute change in volume over six months, we're looking at, at this as a percentage of the baseline volume. How much did it change percentage-wise? Uh, and you can see that almost all the points are shifted to the right, showing a positive benefit to the treatment. Uh, if you look at the x-axis on the bottom, you can see that for many of these brain regions, actually in just six months, the uh, subjects treated with VX15 antibody had one to 2% greater volume in, the, uh, in many of these uh, brain regions of interest. Now, what's not shown here, but what I will tell you is that most of these regions are Here were an additional two panels. The third panel compares what happened in people after the crossover compared to the before the crossover. So these are the people who received placebo for the first six months and then received our drug, the BX15 antibody, for six months. And so we were able to compare the change in their brain during that treatment period of six months compared to the same brain during the six months of placebo. And if you look at that chart, you can see, and we're only showing you the percentage change, you can see it looks very similar to what we saw during that first six month period uh, of VX15 treatment. So the, panel, the second and the third panels are very sim similar. And in fact, the fourth panel is also very similar. And what we did there was we compared the people who received VX15 from the beginning but we looked at the change in their brain between the end of month six and month 12. Uh, again, compared to that first six months of placebo. And again, you can see a very similar pattern. So what was reassuring about this is which suggests that we're preventing atrophy in many different regions of the brain uh, during this, uh, as a result of this treatment. Uh, this next slide here, we actually focused on specific regions of the, of the brain. Now, these have complicated names like the precentral gyrus, the rostral, middle, frontal, and supramarginal gyrus. These are just the names of the different regions of the brain that we're able to distinguish using these imaging methods. And in each of these graphs, there's a red line and a blue line. The red line is the change in MRI volume in that region of the brain over the 12 months of this study. So uh, during the first six months, the red line is showing you placebo. And during the first six months with placebo, you can see there's a decline across the board. In each of these regions, the red line declines by one to 2% during the first six months. At the end of that six month period, there was a crossover to VX15. And so then the line stops declining. It actually stabilizes. The red line becomes more horizontal. So the effect of the drug is to prevent continuing decline in these patients that initially received placebo. And you can see the same thing in the blue line. The blue line are the subjects who were treated with VX15 from the beginning of this study. And you can see that across the board, for the most part, it's stable. There isn't the kind of decline that we saw with placebo, suggesting again that the treatment is preventing, preventing the loss of MRI volume. And so this was actually very exciting that uh, we had a drug that was having this impact on the brain. So we went on uh, and looked at the second imaging mod modality, the so-called FDG PET, which looks at metabolic activity, the use of utilization of glucose in the brain to generate energy for, uh, for brain activities. And again, we're plotting uh, the points or all the many different uh, sub-regions of the brain that we're able to look at using these methods. 
And in the panel on the left, the bars are the 95% confidence limits, so the sort of a statistical measure of the variation within the population. And what we're looking at here is the average change in metabolic activity during the six months of treatment with VX15 antibody minus the average change in metabolic activity during the six months of treatment with placebo. And again, the distribution of the points is uh, very weighted towards the positive side. That vertical line in the middle is again the zero line. And you can see this in the right panel where the same data is expressed as a percentage, that is the change as a percentage of the initial volume of that region during the six month period. And you can really see that the points are shifted to the positive side, suggesting strongly that the treatment is increasing metabolic activity in the VX15 treated patients relative to those who received placebo during the six month period. I want to point out something that's actually very striking here. If you look at the x-axis, that is the horizontal axis on the bottom, on the right-hand side, what you can see now is that for many of these brain regions, the metabolic activity is increased by anywhere from 5 to 20 percent over just this six-month period. That's a very large increase in a relatively short time. And one of the things we're going to want to talk about is what does that mean? Why is there such a large increase? What does that tell us about what's going on? But before we do that, we wanted to see how does this play out in terms of the other groups that we were able to compare. And that's shown on this next slide. So again, the first two panels are the same ones that I just showed you. I put them there so we can compare them. The third panel is a different comparison. It's again, the comparison in the placebo group after crossover to VX15 antibody versus before crossover. Uh, this is a nice comparison because you're looking at the same brain and looking at the same region at two different times, after crossover and before crossover. And you can see again that the effect of the treatment in this group is very similar to what we saw in the first six months, comparing the VX15 treated subjects with the placebo subjects. So it's a consistent result. The surprise, however, comes in the fourth panel. Here we're comparing what happens not during the first six months of treatment, but during the second six months of treatment in the patients who had already received six months of VX15. But now we're looking and asking, well, what continues to happen between the end of month six and month 12? And now the data is very different. Now there's a much smaller change. This is nowhere near the five to 20% change that we were seeing earlier. And so this is another striking observation. What's, what's going on here? Why is that different? Let me explain that the, what's going on in, the, in panels two and three is we're looking at the change during the six months that are the first time that these subjects received VX15, either at the beginning, at time zero in the group, in the VX15 group, or after the crossover in the placebo group, but they had never previously been treated with VX15. In contrast, in the last panel, in the fourth panel, these subjects had already been treated with VX15 for six months, and now we're only looking at what happens with the continuing treatment, the second six months. So this is not the first time that they were treated with the drug. And that's an important point, and we're going to explain why and what that uh, has taught us. But first, uh, let's look again, as we did earlier, at the full 12 months in different brain regions. And again, these have the, the same funny names, caudal, middle, frontal, pars opercularis, pre-central, rostral, middle. These are all uh, cortical regions in the frontal lobe of the brain. Uh, we also are looking at uh, the post-central and supramarginal gyrus in the so-called parietal lobe. But the important thing here is the pattern is very similar across all these regions. Again, the red line is the placebo and the blue line is the antibody. And during the first six months, uh, in all cases, the red line declines. It's actually declining more sharply than the MRI did. But then when we have the crossover in the red line at the end of six months, it goes up sharply. It doesn't just flatten out. It doesn't just stabilize. It actually jumps up quite high. It's making up for something that was lost in the past. And you see that same thing in the blue line when you start treatment at time zero. At the very beginning, that line, of course, since those patients are getting VX15 right away, never has that decline that you see in the placebo, right away it jumps up. 
But if you continue treatment past six months, between six months and the end of six months and the end month 12, now it flattens out. It's not perfectly flat, but in general, it has a much uh, uh, shallower slope than the placebo group did during the first six months. And so this is a very different pattern of response from uh, what we saw in the MRI. And this is illustrated, the difference between the two uh, measures is illustrated on this schematic slide here. In the MRI, during the six months of a treatment with placebo, there's a decline. There's a loss of MRI volume, which is believed to reflect atrophy in the different regions of the brain. If we treat with BX15, we have the green line, we prevent that. If we cross over from placebo to VX15, we get that dotted red line, which shows a stabilization. There is not a continuing decline. So this reveals a treatment benefit. That's very important. With the FDG-PET, with the, the study of the metabolic activity, again, looking at the red line, the placebo group, there's a decline. There's a loss of metabolic activity, which is characteristic of the disease process. But when we cross over, we get that dashed red line, very sharp increase, a supernumerary increase in metabolic activity. And you see that same increase in the green line at the very beginning if you started treating with VX15 from time zero. But if you continue treatment from the end of six months to 12 months, you get that dashed green line, you get basically stabilization. You prevent the continuing, any continuing decline, but you don't get that same big jump. So what does that mean? Huntington's disease, of course, is caused by an inherited mutation. And so people who have inherited this mutation have had that mutation since birth. But the disease, as you know, doesn't become manifest until later in life, until midlife. What that means is that, and which is when patients, when subjects were enrolled in this study, which means that they had been going for multiple, several decades with an underlying pathological process that had not yet become manifest in terms of disease, but evidently had some accumulated physiological change in the brain that resulted in reduced metabolic activity. What we believe our data is showing is that this accumulated historical deficit that proceeds when the patient started treatment can at least be, be reversed. We don't know if it's 100% reversed or if it's 50% reverse, but it's significantly reverse, so that as soon as you start treatment, you get a big jump in metabolic activity. However, if you continue treatment, you can't get that big jump again because you've already collected that deficit. And so when you continue treatment, you can prevent the contemporaneous uh, physio physiological process that's resu resulting in reduced metabolic activity, but you don't get that same big jump uh, during the second six months of treatment. Now, this is very exciting for two reasons. First of all, it tells us that our antibody treatment is not only blocking a physiological process that's associated with progression of the disease, but it's actually reversing it, which is why you get that big jump uh, when you first start the treatment. Now, this is potentially valuable in the future. If we can confirm that this is also happening in a larger population of patients who will be enrolled in cohort B of this study, uh, then we may eventually have a biomarker of the uh, effect of our drug. That is, we could imagine a time in the future where uh, someone known to have the Huntington's disease gene starts treatment with this drug at the baseline, has uh, M imaging, uh, F in particular FDG-PET, and then a couple of months later, uh, we do a follow-up study, and we look to see, do we get that big jump? If we get the big jump, then it suggests that the treatment is being effective, and we should continue it. If we don't get it, then maybe it suggests that there's some other process going on in that particular patient, and maybe a different treatment would be more appropriate. And so it could be a very valuable biomarker for, uh, if it's confirmed in, in uh, an expanded study for detecting the uh, efficacy of the drug. Now, I mentioned earlier that uh, we did a number of other things. Of course, one of the things that we did was we were very attentive to safety signals. We want to uh, be certain that our drug is not causing any uh, toxicity uh, and not doing any harm to patients. And we were very pleased 
to find that during the 12 months of treatment, there were no concerning safety signals in this study. And this actually has been true in other studies we have done in other diseases, um, for example, multiple sclerosis. So that was reassuring. And in addition, I mentioned earlier that we also did uh, assessments of motor activity and cognition, which of course is something that's very important to people with Huntington's disease. Now, what I have to say is that the number of patients who were available to undergo those assessments was smaller than the total number of patients in the study. Actually, we only had 15 of the 36 subjects and half of them were treated with placebo. So we only had about seven or eight subjects who could really be evaluated. And that's a very small number for these kinds of tests, particularly when you're only looking at a period of around six months. So we were not able to draw we didn't have sufficient evidence for conclusion about the effect of our drug on motor activity and cognition. But importantly, the results did allow us to predict how many subjects we would be enrolled in cohort B in order to increase the likelihood that we would reach a meaningful conclusion with regards to motor activity and cognition. And we're, there are calculations that can be made using uh, the variation in the data and so forth that we were able to do. And as a result of the, this data, we have now modified the design of cohort B and we've increased the number of patients that we plan to enroll in this study. We have submitted an amendment to the protocol to the FDA and we hope next week to have clearance of that amendment. Uh, and that will allow us to expand this study of cohort, in cohort B to 200 subjects. And this will include electrodromal and neurodegenerative subjects, about 80 electrodromal and neurodegenerative And people who need to be able to do Treatment. We'll be happy, George, to answer any questions that people may have. Thank you, Maurice. Um, so I think hopefully folks could hear the end. I know we were having a little, some audio difficulties at the very end, um, the last 30 seconds. I, I don't know if you touched on, you mentioned that you'll be amending the protocol to increase cohort B to 200 subjects. What was the original uh, goal of, of cohort B? Was it 80 subjects or something like that? Yes, that's correct. Originally we thought that we would expand to 80 subjects, but we're encouraged by the results of cohort A to now uh, enroll a larger population, particularly with a view to getting uh, data that could speak to the issue of the impact of treatment on motor activity and cognition. Okay. <clears throat> um, so, so folks that are, that are on the line, please do send your, your questions in. Maurice, we do have a few questions from the audience. I'd like to uh, send them your way. Um, there are there are there any medications that uh, would exclude patients from participating in the signal study that they would be taking? Right. At, at, the mo at this time, there's only one approved drug for treating uh, chorea in uh, patients who have manifest Huntington's disease, uh, tetrabenzene, dut tetrabenzene. Uh, and that's permitted in this study, so that would be allowed. That would be, okay. Um, would there are folks that are actually participants in this study and they'd like to know if there's an opportunity for, for people who were, for example, in cohort A to stay on the drug prior to FDA approval. Um, so, yes, this is of course something that we, uh, are concerned about and, and think about. We, we do, uh, we're very appreciative of the contribution that people make by participating in this study and allowing us to develop this data. And we do want uh, people who have who've volunteered in that way to be among those who will benefit from this drug. 
but we also need to do this in a way where we can generate the data that can be submitted for approval. So we are we hope to once we've enrolled people in uh, in cohort B, we are contemplating having an open label study in which which we will advise everyone who has already participated in uh, in the signal study about. And that open label study will then be open to people who have previously participated in the study. And so it's our hope that we'll be able to do that and that in that kind of a time frame, uh, we'll be able to extend this treatment to more people. So there's some other comments coming in from, from folks, from family members or caregivers that are, are kind of expressing an interest in how they could be a part of this upcoming uh, or extension of cohort B study for signal. Uh, would you have any recommendations for what family members should do if they're interested in participating in this? Uh, yes, we would very much uh, like people to have an opportunity to do so. And so this study is being run by the Huntington Study Group, HSG. Uh, and on their website, they provide information for contacting them uh, and uh, for the opportunity to um, to enroll at one of the 20 plus sites at which this study is being run across the United States and for cohort B in Canada as well. There's a telephone number as well. So the uh, there's the hunting study group uh, website, but in addition, you can call 800-800-487-7671. I'll repeat that, 800-487-7671. 7671, and the study to reference is the SIGNAL study, and the Huntington Study Group will be able to provide guidance. Great, thanks, Maurice. Um, yeah, and I'd point out, we, you know, at HSA, we're, we're trying to maintain close connections with uh, communications with the folks over at HSG, so as, as there are new sites or um, become active for this study, uh, we try to make sure that all of that information is also available for family members that are familiar with um, the HD Trial Finder database, or HD, uh, hdtrialfinder.org. So uh, I think site contact information, emails uh, for getting involved in this study and others are available there. Uh, I just want to mention that. Um, all right, questions. Uh, question about, so as you mentioned very early on uh, in your introductory comments, Maurice, that the hypothesis is for this antibody is that it would block semaphore and 4D, which is a player in neuroinflammation potentially in the it is a player in neuroinflammation in the brain and body. Are there any kind of neuroinflammation inflammatory markers that are part you know of your study that you're looking at to see if the drug is improving? Uh, a readout of neuroinflammation? Well, yes, we do a lot of assays. So in the course of the study, we retrieve serum samples uh, and uh, in some patients, uh, samples of cerebral spinal fluid. And we have a whole variety of assays for uh, inflammatory markers that might be present in, in those fluids. Uh, and those are being pursued actively in order to see whether there's evidence for a reduction in the inflammatory response following treatment. Okay. Um, wait, another question here. Um, there's a question, let's see. Uh, your first, sorry, it moved on me here. Um, your first study you mentioned, uh, early stage and late stage HD, did the markers in both improve? Um, I'm not sure I understand that question. I think maybe you could re refresh everyone. I'm not sure if you covered this, the, who exactly who was in cohort A? What, were these patients at early stage, late stage, uh, in, in the course of their HD? So there were 36 people, if I remember correctly, like. 15 to 19 received drugs, something in there. Um, what, what, what were the characteristics of the, the patients that received drugs? Right, so that, that's actually a very important question. I'm glad that, that came up. So we, in cohort A, uh, the 
the people who were enrolled included both late prodromal and early manifest patients. In fact, uh, of the 36 subjects, 21 were late prodromal and 15 were early manifest. And I'd like to emphasize that the imaging changes that we saw were similar in both populations. So we're seeing a similar effect of drug, at least in terms of imaging, in both the late prodromal and early manifest population. Now this is important to us because it suggests that uh, preventive treatment in the late prodromal population might be effective. Uh, now, it's more challenging to define appropriate endpoints for FDA approval in the pre-manifest patient population because symptoms are not as uh, striking. Uh, in the early manifest population, we know that there, there's evidence of motor disturbances, motor disorders, uh, and, and some cognitive effects that we can measure and we can look for changes in the, those assessments. We don't know yet whether we can see some early signs of that in the pre-manifest population, although one of the reasons why we're treating, extending the treatment period to 18 months uh, in cohort B is to allow more time to see whether we can detect those kinds of changes. But at this stage, what we can say is we do see very striking and similar uh, imaging effects of treatment. Uh, and therefore, cohort B will include both late prodromal and early manifest uh, subjects who volunteer to enroll. Great, thank you. Um, one, one other question from the audience came in that uh, in, in regards to cohort B, uh, will there, do you foresee that there would be an uh, open label extension when that enrollment is complete? Uh, the, there, it's a good question about what the timing of the open label extension is. Uh, I, I can't actually speak to that right now. Uh, I don't know if it'll be right away when we complete enrollment in cohort B or whether it'll be delayed until we start getting the data from cohort B. Uh, but it, I, I guess you know the consideration there is if we need to do another study, we may have to wait until we enroll in that other study. Whereas if we don't need to do another study, then we could do the open label extension right away. Thank you. Um, one more question uh, is coming in. This just has to do with the route of administration. Uh, family members were wanting to know, is this, a, uh, this antibody, is it delivered via a pill? Is it via an injection? How is it dosed to patient? So that's a very important question. Uh, antibodies cannot be formulated as pills. They're different from small chemicals that, uh, that are used as drugs in other instances. Uh, this antibody is administered intravenously. And so once a month, uh, participants in this study uh, go to the clinic, they undergo a variety of assessments, and then following those assessments, they get their monthly intravenous administration. It takes about an hour for the intravenous administration. It's administered under very controlled conditions to make sure that uh, there are no uh, effects on, on the patient. And as I mentioned uh, to date, I'm happy to say that there have been no concerning uh, negative effects. Uh, but uh, that is a monthly visit to the clinic um, and the drug is administered over a period of one hour. Great. What would, what, I don't know enough about semaphore and 4D. I'm, I'm sure most of the listeners don't either. Um, I'm wondering, in talking to the regulators, like the FDA, what are those side effects that they would be most concerned about by blockading the semaphore and 4D pathway? Is there, is it? Answer. Well, the FDA, yeah. Yeah, is it? The FDA is always concerned about the potential toxicity of any new drug and, and monitors that very carefully. And, and we're very cognizant of that. And of course, we're very, we, we share their concern. Uh, no one has ever been treated with antibody to semaphore and 4D before. This is an entirely novel product that was uh, developed by Vaxinex. And so there was, prior to Vaxinex uh, beginning its clinical studies, there was no data on whether there would be potential toxicity. Um, we now have, actually, this is our third trial. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we had done another phase one study in MS and had a, a a very good safety profile. We also have done studies in cancer where we also have had very good safety profile. 
And so we have good reason now to be uh, to feel that the safety profile of this drug is is uh, does not raise serious concerns. But when we first started these studies, of course, neither we nor the FDA could know, and so we had to do a very careful dose escalation to to carefully monitor that. Great, thank you. Um, I think let me just do one last check. I think that is. All the questions we have from the audience thus far, if there are no others, um, I just want to thank you, Maurice and, and Bassinex, for your efforts and, and for taking the time out of your busy day to present these um, very exciting results to the HD community, and particularly the, those patients that are, I know are on the phone or on the line that uh, have participated in this study. So uh, thank you again. Thank you for all for, for joining us, and uh, we look forward to hosting you all uh, or welcoming you all for uh, an upcoming HDSOA webinar in the coming months. So thank you again, Maurice, and we look forward to chatting with you all soon. Thank you, George. Bye-bye.